In the heart of the Brazilian wilderness lies a prehistoric rock shelter, decorated with thousands of strange paintings. South American archaeologists are finding unusual human remains. The skulls aren't European, but they aren't American Indian either. They belong to none of the prehistoric races known to have set foot in the New World. These skulls are as old as the Ice Age. So who were these first people to discover the Americas? And what became of them? Did they all disappear? Or did some of them survive? This is Serra da Capivara, a rocky outcrop of cliffs and valleys in a remote corner of northeast Brazil. Local farmers have long known about these rock shelters hidden behind the brush. Shelter walls are decorated with scenes from everyday life. A net to catch deer. A stick to collect honey from a beehive. A hand shielding the eyes. Here, three people are helping a pregnant woman give birth. Some of the paintings are harder to interpret. These curious looking figures are thought to be men in disguise, dancing with women. Other images show human figures with decorated bodies. Some wear masks. They hint at some kind of ritual. No one yet has figured out what these scenes mean. But local farmers claim to know who originally painted them. Our elders used to tell us they'd been made by Indians, known locally as the fierce ones. <laughs> Indians were the obvious candidates. Most of the people who live in northeastern Brazil today are descended from European settlers and African slaves. These ancestral groups arrived in Brazil just 500 years ago. When the Portuguese first discovered Brazil, they found that Indians were already here. And a few of the local villagers are descendants of mixed marriages between Indians, farmers, and slaves. Indians, in fact, had been in America for thousands of years. Scientists today can tell precisely when they arrived and from where. 
All native peoples in South and North America belong to a racial type known as Mongoloid. They're descended from the ancient peoples of Siberia. During the Ice Age, 12,000 years ago, there was a land bridge between Siberia and Alaska. Mongoloid peoples were the first to enter the New World, or so experts thought. The Brazilian finds point to a very different story of the discovery of the Americas. The paintings on these rock shelters are much older than the Indians. Here, hunters chase giant armadillos, an animal that flourished during the Ice Age, long before the arrival of the Indians. There's a playful feel to many of the scenes. Here, a group of men are standing on each other's shoulders, just like a circus act. And here, a rare romantic moment. The scenes conjure up a lost world of innocence. How long ago was this primeval paradise? French archaeologists have just finished digging in Pedra Ferrada, the largest of the rock shelters. Their aim was to go back in time to a period well before the arrival of American Indians. Every foot they dug took them thousands of years back into prehistory. When they reached layers 40,000 years old, they found these. Pieces of quartzite that look remarkably like stone tools. The edges on one side of the stones were flaked off. Were these stones shaped into cutting tools by human hands? If so, then the history of the discovery of the Americas would have to be rewritten. But if people had been here before the American Indians, surely there would be other traces of their presence. The archaeologists continued to dig, down to depths 50,000 years old. And then they found this. Fragments of animal bone and charcoal. For Anne Marie Passy, one of the archaeologists involved in the dig, these fragments were proof of human occupation. We found structures shaped like hearths. Next to the charcoal, depending on the period, we sometimes found food leftovers of animals they may have eaten. The Brazilian finds show that the New World was discovered tens of thousands of years earlier than previously believed, certainly well before the time of the American Indians. But who were these pioneers? A much earlier wave of mongoloids or another race altogether? 
clues to the identity of the first Americans are emerging in rock shelters in the northeast and southeast of Brazil. Archaeologists there have recently unearthed human remains. Prehistoric skulls were found buried in layers of soil 9 to 12,000 years old. They are the oldest skulls in the Americas. And this is the oldest of them all. The skull of a young woman nicknamed Luthia by scientists. Can she tell us who the first Americans were? Walter Nevis is a physical anthropologist at Sao Paulo University in Brazil. He has been using a standard and reliable archaeological measure, the shape of the skull, to find out what race she belonged to. He fully expected Luthia to be a mongoloid, an ancestor of the American Indians. But then he fed the measurements into the computer. When we start running the computer and seeing the results, uh, it was amazing because we realized that uh, uh, the statistics, the quantitative analysis we were doing was not showing just people to be mongoloid. In fact, the analysis was showing just people was anything except mongoloid. So who was Luthia? And where did she come from? To find out, the skull was taken to a hospital in Rio de Janeiro to begin the process of reconstructing her face. The first stage was to make a three-dimensional CAT scan of Luthia's skull in order to build a replica. was then given to Richard Neve of the University of Manchester in England, one of the world's leading forensic artists, to recreate her features. To me, is a Negroid face that has all the features that you associate with a Negroid face. The um, proportions of the face, it doesn't say anything about it being a mongoloid. Luthia belongs to a race found historically along the rim of the Indian Ocean. In East Africa, in the islands of South Asia, and in Australia and Melanesia. Was this then the face of a first American? Her reconstruction is confirmed by measurements Walter Nevis has taken of all his skulls. The first reaction uh, was not to believe in it. But as the results, you know, repeated, repeated, repeated so many times, and the result is exactly the same thing. They are very similar to nowadays Aborigines and Africans, and no similarity at all with Mongoloids in Asia or with American Indians. 
But how could Luthia be African and Australian? According to Walter Nevis, there's a very simple explanation. Luthia is a bit of both. The first humans originated in Africa. It's known that around 100,000 years ago, waves of people migrated out of Africa. One such wave went east, and 60,000 years ago, it reached Australia. Luthia, it seems, belonged to a race of humans descended from Africans, a race that eventually became today's Australian Aborigines. But if the first people to enter the New World were the ancestors of present-day Aborigines, how could they possibly have reached the Americas? Australia and Southeast Asia are on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, more than 8,000 miles away from South America. It's true that during the Ice Age, there was a land bridge between Siberia and Alaska. In theory, the ancestors of the Aborigines could have migrated north and crossed over into Alaska. But they wouldn't have made it very far. A permanent mass of ice sat on Canada for thousands of years. That wall of ice would have blocked the way into America to both animals and humans. But could there have been another route to South America? One has to consider all the probabilities. It's much simpler to cross the ocean than to adapt to the cold of the North Pole. After all, you do need to develop a fairly sophisticated technology to survive in the cold. But did the ancestors of the Aborigines have the technology to cross the Pacific? These are the Tiwi people, an Aborigine clan living on Bathurst Island, just off the northern coast of Australia. As far back as they can remember, their way of life has always revolved around the sea. And in these shallow tropical waters, the old-fashioned spear is still the best tool to catch crabs. But the Tiwis are very much the exception. Most Aborigines live on the mainland and have no seafaring heritage. But what about the Aborigines' very earliest ancestors? Might they have been able to navigate? Curiously, the best clues to the culture of the first Australians are to be found far away from the coasts. This is the Kimberley, a forbidding rock desert on the northern tip of Western Australia. Today, the place is uninhabited. But during the Ice Age, 20 to 50,000 years ago, these were hunting grounds for the first Aborigines.
Graham Walsh, an Australian rock art specialist, has devoted his life to finding and recording their earliest traditions. The area is surrounded by rock shelters, many of them decorated with images painted tens of thousands of years ago. In one rock shelter, Graham Walsh has discovered a painting that is about to rewrite the history of seafaring. It's the oldest painting of a boat anywhere in the world. The people in the boat have got very distinctive headdresses on. And uh, they're associated with a type of figures that we call simple uh, northern figures that are found in this area of the North Kimberley here. They're associated with uh, war scenes, battle scenes, where they're not using uh, spear throwers. And so we can date that type of figure by the type of technology that they're depicted with. And it's very ancient because the spear throwers, we've dated paintings with spear throwers on as predating 17,000 years. And that's a minimum figure. I think it will go back much, much older than that, up to 50,000 years ago. What's remarkable is that the boat seems to have been designed with a very specific purpose in mind. You can see by the type of watercraft with the high prow on it, it, it appears by uh, sort of uh, watercraft experts, they tell me it's an ocean going type craft with this high nose, there's no need for all the sort of uh, high prows and that in still water. So you're looking at some sort of craft that's been used for the open sea. In this remote rock shelter, is the first indication that the ancestors of the Aborigines did indeed have the technology to sail, and perhaps even to navigate the oceans. But why would they have wanted to cross the Pacific? The vastness of the ocean was surely a deterrent. More and more, scientists are convinced that the very first ocean crossings may have happened by accident. It's not such a far-fetched idea. Three years ago, five fishermen, well, only two made it out of the original five, set off in the middle of a storm off Africa. They arrived here in Brazil, they decided to stay. They didn't want to return to Africa. Sure, it was an adventure, an odyssey, but they made it in just three weeks. They survived. And if they survived, others could have done so too. If the ancestors of the Aborigines did reach South America by chance, they would have been the first people to settle the new world. They would have become the American Aborigines. But if this is what happened, where are their descendants? Why are there none of these American Aborigines in North and South America today? One possibility is that for a long time they lived alone in the continent, leading an idyllic life, free from invaders. After all, the land route from Asia into North America remained firmly blocked for thousands of years. But around 14,000 years ago, the climate began to warm up.
the Ice Age was coming to a dramatic end. In Alaska, an ice corridor opened up. Animals took advantage and crossed through. Chasing them were mongoloid hunters. It's well known that around 12,000 years ago, the ancestors of today's American Indians entered the New World. The mongoloids moved swiftly, colonizing North and South America in just a few thousand years. That's precisely the time frame when scientists believe the American Aborigines begin to disappear. Could the Mongoloids have replaced the Aborigines? This is very clear in South America. All populations I have in my data set from the whole of South America, okay, from 7,000 to the present, they are absolutely classic Mongoloids. And everything I have with more than 9,000, okay, is absolutely non-Mongoloid. So I would say this replacement occurred between, occurred between nine and 7,000 years ago. Rock art experts have been studying the Brazilian paintings for clues about how that replacement might have happened. Here may be an explanation for how the American Aborigines became extinct. This scene shows several men in midair. They look as if they're flying. At first, scientists assume they reflected the playful lifestyle of the American Aborigines. But computers can shed new light. Images can be digitally removed and then reintroduced one at a time. The happy flying figures turn out to be just one figure, a warrior leaping through the air to spear an enemy. At first, we thought this was a scene of harmony, with various figures flying through the air. Now we no longer see it as a scene of harmony, but as a scene of violence. Suddenly, the meaning of the other enigmatic scenes becomes clear. This is another act of aggression. And this, perhaps, an execution. Were the Mongoloids at war with the Aborigines? Tellingly, these scenes only begin to appear after the arrival of the Mongoloids. Until 9,000 years ago, we don't find a single scene of violence. And this coincides with finds which show an increase in population. We can't draw any conclusions, but there is an increase in small tribes, and violence becomes very important. Conquest by the Mongoloids would explain why there are no Aborigines in the Americas today. They were wiped out.
But persecuted peoples often avoid extinction, either through intermarriage with the invader or by escaping into the wilderness. Could some American Aborigines have survived in a remote corner of the New World? At the southernmost end of the continent lies Tierra del Fuego, a group of islands isolated from the mainland by the Strait of Magellan. The oldest skull found in this part of the world is 9,000 years old. It, too, was measured by Walter Nevis. This skull also shows a strong similarity with Australians and no similarity at all with nowadays Indians or Mongoloids. Okay? So even in, in, in the extreme southern cone of the Americas, okay, was uh, inhabited by these people that has nothing to do with Mongoloids. It seems that some tribes of American Aborigines may have escaped, finding sanctuary here at the far end of South America. So what became of them? Where are their descendants? When the first Europeans explored Tierra del Fuego, they encountered bands of hunters and gatherers, the Fuegians. An Italian ethnographer recorded their way of life in the 1930s. It seemed to hark back to a primordial era. Sisters Christina and Ursula Calderon are children of those hunters and gatherers. They were born just over 70 years ago in this small village, now abandoned. Could these sisters be actual descendants of Luthia and the American Aborigines? On the face of it, no. Their appearance is not very different from that of other Native Americans. But a more reliable marker of ancestry lies behind the face, the shape of the skull. The local museum houses several skulls of modern Fuegians, recent ancestors of Christina and Ursula. For the first time, scientists have begun to measure these skulls. As expected, they have found some classic mongoloid traits, such as flat faces but they also found unusual features, pronounced ridges over the eyes, a distinctly non-mongoloid characteristic. were somehow related to the ancestors of the Australian Aborigines. We think that Fuegians is the, the nowadays Fuegians or the historic Fuegians are the result of interbreeding between the non-Mongoloids and the Mongoloids. <laughs> it seems that some American Aborigines may have avoided extinction by intermarrying with the Mongoloids seven to nine thousand years ago and then retreating to Tierra del Fuego where they lived in isolation until the 20th century. But the Aborigines were originally a race adapted to life in the tropics. How could they have survived in this cold and damp corner of South America?
Argentine archaeologists have pitched their tents on the shores of lakes and inlets in search of clues. <laughs> on this beach, they found mounds of mussel shells. The oldest layer is six to seven thousand years old. Is this ancient garbage left behind by American Aborigines? Mounds of shells have been found all over the beach. The mounds are overgrown with grass, but they have a distinctive shape. Each one is built up around a hollow. According to Ernesto Piana, the excavation leader, there's evidence that this sheltered beach was the site of a very ancient settlement. This kind of rounded structures you may see many in this archaeological site in Miwaya, are actually the base of their huts. This was done because people just put some poles around, making a dome, or some like a cone, and living, throwing the debris, the refuse, outside of these round things. Alongside the very same beaches, similar huts were being built by the Fuegians until just 60 years ago. These huts sheltered the American Aborigines through thousands of winters of wind, rain, and snow. Some tribes wore hides of guanaco, a type of llama, to keep the cold out. But others wandered around virtually naked. How did they cope with the cold? Tierra del Fuego was surrounded by colonies of seals. Seal oil rubbed on the skin offered protection against the cold and damp. It was also especially high in calories. A spoonful a day provided extra resistance to the cold. We were given spoonfuls of seal oil. That's how I grew up healthy. And I guess that's why I'm still here today. They said it was very good for the kids, but only in winter, not in summer, because in summer your face comes out in a rash of spots. The Fuegians also kept fires lit indefinitely, even when they were on the move. They lit their fires in the canoe. And I'd ask, how come the boat doesn't burn? No, the fires were lit on a layer of damp grass. So long as the fire is small, the canoe doesn't catch fire. Isolated from the rest of the continent, the descendants of the American Aborigines preserved their way of life for thousands of years. But there's something else. They appear to have also kept alive their rituals. The 1930s expeditions recorded secret initiation ceremonies. Before boys could be led into the secrets of the tribe, they had to face up to spooks and spirits.
According to the ethnographic reports, boys and women believed the ghosts were real. Could such rituals help decipher the enigmatic scenes on the Brazilian rock shelters? The dancing spooks with their masks and stripes are strangely familiar. wisdom taught to the Fuegian initiates was secret. It was only revealed to men. Women were kept in the dark. Any speculation about it was, and still is, strictly taboo. They said it was a very secret ritual. That's why we never talked about it. Only the men were supposed to know about it. What was so secret that it had to be kept from the women? Some of the chiefs, according to ethnographers, explained that there was a time in a very distant past when women ruled society. So the women must never know, lest the men lose their grip on power. Perhaps the story was brought into the New World by the American Aborigines, because similar legends have been recorded amongst Aborigine tribes in Australia. Amazingly, traditions of the first peoples of Australia appear to have been preserved here at the utmost end of the earth by a small band of their descendants. <laughs> but after surviving 50,000 years, the memory of those traditions is now at risk of being lost forever. arrival of white settlers in the late 19th century pushed the native people of Tierra del Fuego to the brink of extinction. The guanaco was one of the main sources of food. But when European settlers arrived, they saw a land ideally suited for something else. Gradually, the guanaco hunting grounds were transformed into vast sheep stations. It seems that the Fuegians thought they could simply switch to hunting sheep. It was a tragic mistake. European landlords thought nothing of killing poachers in cold blood. Christian missionaries tried their best to help the natives adapt to the changing circumstances. Women and children were brought to the missions to be clothed and educated. But this only made matters worse, as the Fuegians came into contact with European diseases for the first time. There was a virulent disease, and many died from that. A few survived, but then came a stomach illness, and many more died. Many babies and adults. I was ill too, but I pulled through.
the deaths eventually decimated the villages. Thirty years ago, Christina and Ursula had to abandon the village where they grew up and move into a white settlement. They return occasionally to visit the graves of their family. Christina and Ursula are now the last surviving link to the culture of the pioneering Aborigines who first discovered the Americas. For they are two of only a few full-blooded Fuegans left alive. Their children are the offspring of mixed marriages. Just as it did 9,000 years ago, intermarriage, this time with Europeans, may save something of the American Aboriginal culture from complete extinction. The Fuegians' ancestors had set off from the other side of the world. Their arrival in Tierra del Fuego was the culmination of an epic journey across ocean and continent. They were the first to discover the Americas. Fifty thousand years later, their descendants have dwindled to a handful of survivors. But who knows? Perhaps the Fuegians were not the only Aborigines to survive the arrival of the Mongoloids. Maybe another tribe of long lost American Aborigines is awaiting discovery in some remote corner of the Brazilian jungle. <laughs>